Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second plenary session, which will explore changing practices in dementia from the medical and clinical point of view. I would also like to welcome and thank our four distinguished speakers who will share their views and expertise on the subject. As to presenting myself, I am Charles Sherry, a senior academic member of the Faculty of Medicine and Surgery at the University of Malta. My main interest lies in the understanding of the behavioral, pharmacological, and social aspects of Alzheimer's disease. I am the co-founder and general secretary of the Malta Dementia Society, board member of Alzheimer Europe, and chairperson of the Malta Dementia Strategy Group. I would like to remind you that this session will be in English, but translation will be provided, so feel free to use the electronic equipment provided. I would also appreciate if you could switch off your mobile phones or put them in silent mode. We will have four presentations in this session of 20 minutes each. Each question will be taken at the end and not after each presentation. If you make any question, please introduce yourself to the floor and make your questions concise and to the point as a courtesy to the other members of the audience who would also wish to be involved in the discussion. This session will focus on two very important aspects of dementia, the medical and the clinical aspects. Although the number of individuals with dementia is increasing and will continue to do so in the future, Early and timely diagnosis remain difficult and significant disparities exist between different countries. New criteria for diagnosis and novel diagnostic techniques, including the use of imaging, have been put forward in the hope of catching dementia at the earlier stages and possibly leading to positive outcomes, such as delaying institutionalization and reduce the burden of care. Since most common forms of dementia cannot be cured yet, a lot of research is being directed towards prevention or delaying the onset. It has been established a few years back that a five-year delay in the onset of Alzheimer's disease will decrease its prevalence by half. Developing new treatment options that reverse, halt, or significantly delay the disease progression would be a major breakthrough in the management of the condition but unfortunately, this is still a long way ahead. These interesting topics will form the basis of this particular session, which I'm sure you will find appealing. Our first presentation is by Professor Bruno Dubois. Professor Dubois is a professor of neurology and neurological institute of Salpetriere University Hospital in Paris. He is also the director of the Dementia Research Center at the Salpetriere Hospital. He has published on anatomical and biochemical studies on the central cholinergic system in rodents and humans, on cognitive neuropharmacology, and on neuropsychology in patients with dementia, with special reference to memory and executive functions. He has recently organized an expert consensus on the new criteria for Alzheimer's disease. Professor Dubois will be talking to us about changing the criteria for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Thank you, Professor. Good morning, everybody. So it's a pleasure for me to present to you this new approach that we have proposed with several colleagues, most of them being European, so I'm happy to present it to you at the Alzheimer Europe, and one of these is just in front of me, Professor Frizzoni. So it's a pleasure for me to present to you, besides the new criteria, the new concept that we want to, to develop concerning the disease. These are my disclosures. We, we have learned and we, we still educate our medical student in our medical school that, uh, I have to, to look at carefully, that, uh, I don't see precisely, that Alzheimer's disease is a, it's difficult to see, uh, that, I'll, you can read it, 
globally that Alzheimer's disease is, uh, is difficult. The diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is difficult to, to, to make and can only be certified by post-mortem confirmation that can be drawn by biopsy or by post-mortem examination. And that for that reason, the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis can only be probable. We cannot certify it in a clinical point of view. And then, because it's a difficult diagnosis, it should only be made when the patient reach the threshold of dementia. So this, these are the three rules that have been uh, proposed by the NENCDS ADA-ADA criteria proposed in 84. And you have here the representation of this concept, clinical pathological entity. The diagnosis can only be probable at a clinical point of view we need the neuropathological confirmation to, to reach the, the certainty. And then, as the diagnosis can only be made when the patient is demented, it opens the door to this, this uh, MCI stage, which is a stage where the patient can be included because we cannot make the diagnosis as a stage because he's not yet demented. So the, the MCI construct is only due to the fact that we consider at that time that Alzheimer's disease is a disease that can only, that can only be diagnosed when the patient reaches the threshold of dementia. 20 years after, it appears that the NENCDS and criteria have some limitations. First, they have a low accuracy. They have a lower accuracy because they didn't take into account the specific features of the disease that we have discovered from, since this time, and I will develop this later on. And the second reason of the, of the limitation of this uh, uh, criteria is that, as I explained to you, they occur late in the course of the disease, and we don't see why we should wait that the patient reach the threshold of dementia for doing the diagnosis of the disease. I don't know why, I cannot understand why Alzheimer's disease is the only disease in all the medical story for which we have to wait a certain stage of severity for doing the diagnosis of the disease. I used to say that, for example, if I have a little tremor of the right hand and it, I see a neurologist, he would make the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. He will not wait that I am bedridden for making the diagnosis of, of Parkinson's disease. Why, for Alzheimer's disease, we have to wait that the patient is demented? That's an interesting question. So, at that time, we decided in uh, 2007 that we should try to, 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 to answer to these two requirements. First, to be earlier, and second, to be more specific, because, as I told you, the accuracy was not so good at that time. First, to be earlier. There is at least two main reasons to be earlier. The first is that as Alzheimer's disease is already at work, at work in the brain of the patient before dementia, the, the, the development, the current development of disease modifier drugs are proposed too late in demented patients where the amyloid burden is, is too big, it's too important. So it may be the reason why these uh, results that you have seen during the summer turn negative, at least on a clinical standpoint, because probably this immunotherapy has been tried and has been developed too late in the course of the disease. The second reason is on a clinical point of view, and you have here the list of arguments that may uh, be considered concerning an earlier diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And on a clinical point of view, there are several reasons. Maybe the most important is that the patients ask us precisely to give them the diagnosis of their cognitive impairment, even in an early stage. So to be earlier, rise the following question. What is and what can be today the modern definition of Alzheimer's disease. Should it be clinically defined as today, as a dementia? It means 
Should it be clinically defined by a stage of severity, such as the dementia? Or should it be defined clinically with the first symptom specific of the disease? As far as we can identify a specific symptom of Alzheimer's disease. And that's an important question we have to discuss now. Or should it be biologically defined by the presence of a biomarker, which is a surrogate of the, the neuropathology, the underlying Alzheimer pathology, and which may indicate that the disease is here, even though the patient, the subject, do not, does not express any clinical symptoms. We don't think what we should, that we should go so far because we don't know precisely what is the algorithm of conversion to an overt clinical disease in those who are biomarker positive. And unless we know precisely what, are, what is the algorithm that may help us to predict those who are biomarker positive that will, that will develop the clinical disease, we should be very careful because I think it will be very dramatic to speak about Alzheimer's disease in normal subjects which may never develop the disease. So we consider that we should not go so far, but we consider that it is very timely to go from the, 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 the dementia point to the first clinical symptom of the disease, at least if we can identify that they are specific. And this is, this is the question, because unfortunately, any disorder of the brain, any functional or organic disorder of the brain may more or less have an influence of memory, episodic memory, and more precisely on free recall. And indeed, we may have a low free recall in depression, in MCI, in AD, in certain iatrogenicity for say, certain drugs, subcortical dementia, confusional state, frontotemporal dementia, vascular disorders, normal aging, sleep disorders, and so on. So this is a problem that we have to, we have to, to disentangle. How can we manage this? We have people who are complaining about the memory, most of them being not related to any specific problem of the brain, only because they are tired or they are attention disorder. How can we disentangle this? As a clinician, we are very happy with this problem because in Alzheimer's disease, there is a specific pattern, and that's very important. We have described this. There is a specific pattern of memory disorders, and I will explain you why. Because Alzheimer's disease is the only disease where the memory disorder is due to an epicapal damage. That's a big chance that we have because there is a specific lesion of the brain at the early stage of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease starts at the level of the epicampus, more precisely at the arterial cortex and the performed pathway and the epicampal region. This is on the left. So, because of this specific um, damage of the hippocampus, there is a specific pattern of memory disorder that we may help us to identify the disease among the others that may cause episodic memory problem. And I would like to explain you how we can do that. <laughs> to be recall a stimulus, whatever it is, should go through three different stages. First is registration. The first stage need to register the information and this is due to attention resources. We need to be attentive to the information. And for example, if you are depressed, you will not pay enough attention to the information. So at the end of the day, if I ask you to recall the information, you will probably 
not be able to retrieve this, not because you have a memory problem, but only because you have an attention disorder. The second stage is storage. That means that after the information has been registered, it should go through the memory system in order to be transformed in memory trace. And this relies on the epicampal formation. This is damage in Alzheimer's disease. Here, you will not transform a, per a perception into a memory trace. The information is, cannot be stored in the brain. There is a storage problem due to hippocampal damage. And in this case, there would be a free recall, not because of attention disorder, but because of the fact that the, the information is no more stored in the brain. And the third stage is retrieval. The retrieval is the ability to activate strategy for retrieve information which is in the brain. And this rely on the frontal lobes, and this is impaired in the frontal temporal dementia, subcortical dementia, or even, even normal aging, where in normal aging, you know, there is a frontal hypoperfusion of the frontal region, and this is at the origin of what we call the tip of the tongue phenomenon. So we need to use tests that can disentangle this, that is, which provide cues in order to control for the registration stage and that can help and facilitate retrieval in order to isolate the storage deficit which is specific of Alzheimer's disease. And these tests exist and we work, we work on, with these tests and we have described what we have called the amnesic syndrome of the hippocampal type. And interestingly, recently Wagner uh, in the neurology um, present the added value of this test for picking patients who do have Alzheimer's disease within a larger group of MCI patients. And you can see here the performance of the test. The total recall score may predict the presence of Alzheimer pathology in the patient. In other words, with this test, you can identify those patients who do have Alzheimer, as it has been shown by the presence of specific changes in the, in the, in, in the CSF uh, of, of the patients. And with this test, you can discriminate with a very high performance when compared to the logical memory uh, of the vexillary memory scale or the CRED uh, delayed recall. This has a very high performance in order to predict those who will have an abnormal CSF indicative of Alzheimer's disease. So I was speaking about specificity, and specificity is also provided by new uh, ex uh, PET examination that can help us to identify the lesion, Alzheimer's lesion in the brain of patient in vivo. As you know, uh, this beautiful works from uh, we also have the possibility, to, the possibility to identify a specific pattern in the CSF of patients, as I already told you. So, for all these reasons today, we now have a specific pattern in different domain, memory, CSF, MRI, PET-FDG, pet ligon, which are specific of Alzheimer's disease, as I told you, as I show you now. And interestingly, it has been shown that each of these specific patterns was present at a, at a prodromal stage, that is a predementia stage of the disease. This is not a surprise because these markers are not markers of stage, but markers of disease. For example, the pathophysiological marker, the lesion of the brain, are not related to the stage, but are related to the disease itself. So it is present even at an early stage of the disease. So now we, we, we no more need to refer to dementia because we have a, um, a, a cognitive test that can pick and can identify patients at the prodromal stage and we have bio, biomarkers, pathophysiological markers, which are specific of the disease, which are also positive at an early stage of the disease. So 
For this reason, we have proposed the new criteria I will go through. You, you know this, this slide. But what is important in this, there are two, two important things. First, we no more make reference to dementia threshold for proposing the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And the second information is that we think that it is possible to make the diagnosis based on a, bio, on a clinical biological entity, clin a specific phenotype on a clinical level, and a biological um, biomarker which can certify the presence of Alzheimer's disease. So this is the new diagnostic approach. Before 2007, the diagnosis can, could only be made when the patient is demented, and this was mostly an exclusionary process by, by excluding other causes. And today, we propose to make the diagnosis in a positive way based on a specific clinical phenotype, the amnestic syndrome of the epicapal type, and the presence of the pathophysiological biomarker which certify the presence of an under, underlying pathology. So the conceptual shift, if I come back to the first slide, showing to you the, the schema associated with the uh, 84, 84 criteria, this is the new proposal in which there is no more reference to neuropathology, we don't need the neuropathological confirmation because we think that we have the equivalent, a surrogate marker by the biology. So the biology provides us the, uh, the, the, the uh, information about the underlying pathology. So this is now a clinical biological entity based on a clinical phenotype and on a specific biomarker, pathophysiological marker. And as you can see, there is no more reference to dementia. These uh, new criteria should be mostly applied in research setting because we will need a very high diagnostic accuracy for uh, the follow-up of, of specific cohorts or for clinical trials. But it may also apply in the very specific situation in expert center for advanced diagnosis when there is a, a difficult case, for example, young onset Alzheimer's disease or complex cases, and if you have the resource in the, in the centers, you may apply the criteria. And based on this, we have proposed a new lexicon in 2010 that I would like to, to discuss with you, if I can read it. The first we have proposed now that Alzheimer's disease is a clinical entity which starts with the first clinical symptoms and which encompasses both the prodromal predementia and dementia stage. Alzheimer's disease dementia refers to the stage of the disease where there is an impact on activity of daily living. Prodromal Alzheimer's disease refer to the pre-dementia stage of the disease, that is a symptomatic phase, pre-dementia symptomatic phase. Typical Alzheimer's disease refer to the most common aspects of Alzheimer's disease characterized by an amnestic syndrome of the epicapal type and that is confirmed by the presence of patho pathophysiological biomarker. Atypical Alzheimer's disease refer to less common but, but well-characterized well and well-phenotyped um, clinical uh, syndrome, which are logopenic aphasia, uh, posterior cortical atrophy, frontal variant. But we need here again the presence of pathophysiological biomarker to relate this clinical phenotype to the underlying Alzheimer pathology. Mixed Alzheimer's disease has been also defined. Asymptomatic at risk referred to the cognitively normal biomarker positive subjects, but we consider that we should not speak about pre-symptomatic because they are only at risk. At the difference of those who have a mutation, Alzheimer uh, um, autosomal dominant mutation, and in this case, they will develop the disease. 
So they can be called presymptomatic. And, um, and Alzheimer pathology is the underlying pathology that we can see at the neuropathological point of view. And last, MCI, which now is an entity what we would like that it should be, that it should refer to those patients for, for whom a diagnosis cannot be made. And I think that uh, that's, that's it, and I thank you for your attention.